What is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change? It is an international organization that's actually a sub-organization of the World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations. It was created back in 1988, and it was tasked with providing the world with a clear scientific view on the current state of knowledge in climate change and its potential environmental and socioeconomic impacts. It currently has 195 members. All members of the World Meteorological Organization and the UN are uh, eligible for membership. And so I think an important fundamental basis of understanding for what the role of the IPCC is, it's to uh, provide clear statements of the current scientific knowledge related to climate change and its impacts. Importantly, those impacts include socioeconomic ones that we've touched on so far this term. And they produce a current, this current state of knowledge in a really interesting and systematic way. This knowledge has increased dramatically since the organization was initially created in the 1980s. And it, it um, generates this knowledge through reviewing the current state of uh, the published research on the, the topics. It summarizes the literature and evaluates its own reports from previous years through a non-bind review process and without a blind scholar selection process. And this is, I think, really interesting in that it's different from the traditional peer review process. I am a, I've been a, a, a journal author, I am now a journal editor, and the double blind review process is kind of at the heart of producing the best well, I mean, it's not perfect, and there's a whole host of uh, uh, criticisms about double-blind. Some, uh, some journals have moved towards a triple-blind uh, procedure in which even the editor doesn't know who wrote a particular paper. But usually the double-blind double process in which the journal author doesn't know who's reviewing their manuscript and the journal reviewer doesn't know who wrote the manuscript that they're reviewing, this allows... Um, as much objectivity into the process as possible to allow you to, to um, evaluate the research on its own merits. And this research process for the IPCC, they, they don't have that non-blind review process. They know who's producing the research. These committees that form these uh, reports are often cutting-edge scholars. We um, There's a lot of really good YouTube videos on... Uh, people who wrote this human security chapter from the 2014 report and criticism by Gledich and others of that report. Um, but when you're summarizing literature, there is knowledge of who produced the research and that could potentially uh, implement uh, uh, some potential biases. I would allow you to, to think about what those, uh, those might be. Uh, and in the research methodology, which they included for this, um, uh, for this chapter, it uh, approximates the literature review process that I use in this class and in, in um, one of my other classes as well, that you're reviewing the current state of knowledge to be able to extract the most important themes, the most important conclusions, and that really allows the reader to have an idea of what the current state of knowledge is, where the gaps are, and where there could be areas in which uh, researchers could make uh, the... Uh, as impactful uh, um, effort as possible to growing the state of knowledge. The 2014 uh, report, I think, was especially the executive summary and the, the press releases from it received a lot of attention, similar to the working group earlier announcement earlier this year for the 2022 report for the for the IPCC meeting that's going to happen later on uh, this year. It's these kind of graphs that really summarize the predicted changes that we've seen over the last century or two since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution and then going uh, forward to what uh, might happen in the future. The temperatures, I mean, this should be old hat by now in this class. Uh, temperatures are, are increasing, sea level change is increasing, and the kind of um, greenhouse gas emissions that we've touched on is increasing as well. You will see the impact of that in the Arctic uh, Circle case study in just a second, but it's the dramatic shape and speed of these uh, changes that we witnessed and summarized in these graphs that really have gotten policymakers 
um, business uh, businesses and uh, individuals uh, attention so con connecting it to this uh, this one chapter on human security from the 2014 report I think it is the mo the chapter that's the most directly related to the concerns of human security and conflict that we focused on in this class. The main conclusions that I take away from it uh, is that uh, climate change threatens human security by undermining people's livelihoods, their ability to earn a living or to be able to subsist. Uh, it compromises culture and identity for a whole host of reasons. I know some students are focusing on these impacts in their final papers. Uh, increased migration, both domestically and internationally. We spent an entire week talking about the human security impacts of migration, and the cha it challenges states' capacities to be able to respond to citizens' changing needs. Last week, we talked about domestic responses by, <clears throat> by military actors, but also agricultural and um, just uh, infrastructure needs of a lot of states, like in the Nepali case, are really being threatened by the speed and intensity of these challenges faced by, by climate change. They summarized a lot of these efforts from a whole host of published literature that they, um, that they reviewed. They looked at uh, of the effects on livelihood, on culture, and on migration, you're more than welcome to look at the report yourself and t break it up into the different uh, steps from, and this should in some ways approximate the path diagrams we've seen over the entire term. You start by the background environmental change. Uh, here it's a uh, drought or flooding that uh, has a change in, in migration, where this migration is actually occurring, and then the effects that it has. This is a way I think a creative way to summarize the literature. I don't think any students this term made these kind of summary tables, but going forward, I think this is this could be one tool for your toolbox in order to try to summarize a large amount of literature. Uh, and yeah, there's more. Sea level rise also affects the migration. That's also relevant to a number of students' papers. This other this graph from this chapter, I think, also captures a number of the major themes in this class that people's well-being, you could define that also as human security on the bottom, and the vulnerability to environmental change. Um, as you have the ability to move, it increases your well-being and, uh, and um, should uh, uh, decrease the, vul the vulnerability, right? That you have these interacting factors that can shape overall human well-being depending on um, your capacity to, uh, to adapt and the decreased levels of vulnerability and the amount of risk that you're actually facing. Other threats, according to this IPCC chapter, which we're going to be talking more about in the workshop, uh, threats to cultural values, indigenous or local forms of knowledge um, might be lost, but it could also be helpful to, to be able to adapt. We'll see this in the Fault Lines documentary about the Arctic Circle uh, in, uh, in a few videos from now. Migration and mobility are adaptation strategies, again, linking to themes that we've focused on across a number of different weeks. There's, of course, different gendered uh, impacts to migration, as I know a couple of students are writing about for their final papers. And some of the causes of conflict are also affected by climate change. They recognize this in the IPCC report and something that we've also already seen in this, uh, in this class this semester. Several adaptation uh, strategies uh, mentioned in the report, diversification of sources of income in agricultural and fishing systems, we talked about this as well, connecting to state capacity as well as reducing the risk or vulnerability from an over-dependence on any particular uh, resource. Insurance systems for vulnerable groups, adapting consumption patterns, um, which as we uh, see in the chapter are culturally embedded. Seeing that water, like uh, David Foster Wallace's water, consumption patterns might seem um, internalized to the point that we don't actually recognize them. They are norms, but they are culturally determined and have uh, quite dramatic changes over time. Just within my lifespan, I've seen um, consumption patterns related to alcohol and cigarettes change uh, quite dramatically. And so with the climate change effects on the costs of a lot of uh, 
resources that we've seen just from the last year, I think also we're likely to see adaptation strategies uh, change in some new and unexpected ways. If you want to look at this visually, they also have um, a figure that we could also spend some time uh, unpacking in which you look at the over overlapping issues that we've touched on in this class from migration, mobility, uh, culture, the economic and political livelihoods a section from the first part of the class and conflict and how all these things have some areas and overlap and some that are distinct. And I think for our overall framework for trying to understand the multitude of challenges and opportunities related to climate change and uh, livelihoods that there are ways to try to break it down and look at it piece by piece. This is one way of trying to do it. Or you could put it in a big table as well. So connecting climate change to conflict, the outcome that we've spent a disproportionate amount of the semester focusing on, I think this is where for the very first time the IPCC report really spends a lot of time talking about the difficulty in directly connecting background environmental conditions to conflict similar to others in the literature that we've read from Idin Salehin to, um, to Naus Petr Gledic and others. Um, we've looked at the direct and indirect um, uh, pathways between environmental factors and conflict. Most of the research suggests that the relationships are indirect and speculative, thinking about what might happen rather than hardcore evidence about what has actually happened. Um, the IPCC quoted, uh, I think this quote from the IPCC report is interesting and connects to the Darfur conflict, which I know at least one student is writing on. All studies of this conflict agree that it's not possible to isolate any of these specific causes as being the most influential, which gets at the heart of the multi multitude of potential explanatory factors and the importance of def defining your research question to decide what part of the larger puzzle you really want to focus on. So they say um, you can't isolate any specific cause as being the most influential. Most influential, of course, being a sub, uh, um, substantive uh, effect on the likelihood of, of conflict. And then they also say many of the capabilities that are required to adapt to climate change are threatened by ongoing or recent armed conflict. So we see the reciprocal nature of a lot of these relationships that environmental challenges can lead to uh, scarcity, which can turn into conflict. And of course, conflict also has a feedback on increasing potential future scarcity, as well as negative and environmental impacts. The Gledich and, uh, and um, Nordas uh, article for this week, I also thought was really interesting. I've tried to include debates in the literature as part of the assigned readings as much as possible to try to see how these debates actually can be quite explicit and quite uh, tangentious in trying to look at uh, how research always ha is built on a bed of implicit or explicit assumptions, and the assumptions can be questioned. There are conclusions from the assumptions, as long as there's a direct kind of causal link, that can be uh, less fruitful of an area of inquiry than trying to say, okay, if I disagree with the assumptions, how, if I change the assumption, might the relationship shift or the potential outcomes change? So the assumptions are external to the main kind of argument, but they're fundamental to understanding that connection and the potential applicability of that argument to other cases. And so I think for the Gledich and Nordis article, they critique the IPCC report, um, quite tr uh, uh, trenchant critiques. I would encourage you to take a look at it. Um, first, they define human security so generally as it's basically uh, quite difficult to look at the trends empirically. This connects to the very first week of the class in which we talk about how important it is to define our terms because clearly in this class people have different assumptions about what conflict means, uh, how human security should be conceptualized across a whole host of different metrics, and Gledge and Nordis also say that the IPCC because it's in some ways written by a committee, different people might have different backgrounds, different interests, and to try to be as inclusive as a report as possible. It allows the report to speak to a whole host of issues, but it also can limit the potential applicability of it to actually be able to test the conclusions that they reach because the definitions are so broad. They contra uh, contrast the definitions 
uh, with one focused on the likelihood of people being the victim of various forms of violence, a definition that is quite narrow and conceptually clear um, as, as kind of the most extreme example of um, uh, a human uh, form of, of insecurity. However, you could question as to whether uh, that really captures everything that you mean by human security. I know for the students, for their papers, have written on a whole host of different definitions of human security, uh, from economic uh, to cultural to to livelihood um, uh, to um, gender and uh, children's ability to to have a long and fulfilling life. So there are a whole host of different measures of security. Uh, human security conflict, of course, being the most dramatic example of that which is part of the reason why a lot of the literature focuses on it, but that also might miss some of the other elements that we might think would be relevant. So just be sure to be clear about what your definitions are for what you're looking at, and that also defines what literature is relevant to your particular research question. And they also say there's a real danger that any kind of social change is disliked by some group because it, uh, it becomes a threat to someone's human security, um, that if you change um, a society in any way that could be considered a threat to some other part of the society. We can see this in a whole host of different examples, but the whole definition of a society and one in which there is no direct rule that you delegate to your representatives, either voluntarily or involuntarily, in the case of an autocracy, that there is going to be decisions that are, it's, it's, government is about power. Power is about redistribution, and that redistribution can pose threats. And so in defining threats to human security, any kind of effort to mitigate or adapt to climate change could be conceived of as a threat for some group within the state. And that kind of leads me, I mean, that's a brief overview. The IPCC formed in the, during the last years of the Cold War, repeatedly increased its research capacity and the confidence uh, in making claims about what's actually going on in the uh, the environmental system and the effects that it has on social, uh, economic, and political behaviors. Um, and it is that kind of largest and arguably most influential uh, forum for states to get together after this report has been released to try to make commitments based on the findings that they have in that report. Which leads me to my first lecture question. So out of the four ways the IPCC select, um, suggests that climate change threatens human security by undermining livelihoods, compromising culture and identity, increasing migration, and challenging state capacity, which one of those four do you find the most compelling? And that could be however you define compelling, as well as how you defined undermining livelihoods, culture and identity, migration, and the other factors. So if you're interested to hear your, uh, your thoughts, please put your answers in uh, Waddle if you're in my class or in the comments below if you're not. And with that, I will turn to international water resource cooperation. We touched a bit on water as a potential driver of conflict. A month or two ago now, but I wanted to highlight uh, a couple of main takeaways from this, arguably one of the more important international cooperative efforts related to environmental um, uh, resources, and I want to spend a bit of time talking about that. So let's go ahead and turn to that now. <laughs> 